Okay, good afternoon. Nearly tea break or coffee break. Um, so, Michael Bunting, and I'm just going to take you through a quick, very quick, because it's a 15-minute presentation. Can I get the timer going, please, so I don't go over time? Um, on the framework of mindful leadership, I don't want to bore you with too much stats, but and what we found is a lot of people are, uh, will tell you about theories of leadership, but they're not necessarily evidence-based or well-researched, and it's hard to actually get the psychopath, although they're probably not able to change, to actually buy into it and go along with it. So there has to be some science and evidence behind any leadership framework in our view. I, I was lucky enough to uh, work with Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner for 10 years. They've got the world's most researched leadership model and a 700 independent academic studies on this. And I wrote a book with them in 2015, and it was part of the honing of the process of what does pure art leadership look like, what does great leadership look like. And as many of you know, it's probably just common sense. And then in 2016, I wrote The Mindful Leader, which was an integration of Jim and Barry's work and all of my work, and adult development theory, adult transformational work. You may be sitting here through this day getting a ton of tips thrown at you, and a lot of information thrown at you, but interestingly, brand new research coming out of Harvard University's adult development uh, faculty will say that you can only develop one behavior change in 12 months. And the chances are that you will fail anyway if you don't understand your unconscious fears and commitments. So it's kind of ironic. I'm going to give you um, quite a few sort of seven practices around mindful leadership, but when we do large change, transformational change, which we do in big organizations, we always only ask leaders to commit to one behavior change and really work for a period of 12 months. And you can't change on an event either. That's the other problem. So I just, have, just to give you that, that uh, background info. Um, and then in 2017, we created an app because we found that people didn't really know what to do and, uh, to com continually cultivating a practice after the events, and they couldn't have us there all the time. And then we decided to research this. So when, we, when I wrote The Mindful Leader, we seven disciplines of leadership, and, and uh, I'll talk to you about them in a minute. But we said, well, let's see what the evidence tells us. I mean, do these practices make a difference? Are they, and they, luckily, they, off, they build off the world's most researched leadership practices. We created this 360, and we were very lucky to have um, several organizations do a large-scale use of the 360. Two of the big names you'll probably recognize are Westpac Bank and Hilton Hotels but a lot of other organizations too, and we researched the leaders um, on how they're doing on these seven practices of mindful leadership. And what we found was really interesting. We found that 40% of a person's engagement can be correlated to the way they rate their boss. So a person doesn't experience a culture, they mostly experience their boss. We're actually working right now on one of the biggest culture change pro project, commercial change projects in the world. And it's really interesting because they've got this beautiful CEO, but some people are still experiencing tremendous pain in this culture that's moving along beautifully because they're still experiencing their leader, their boss. That's where you primarily experience the culture. 40% of engagement is a big deal if you're interested in performance because we know that the great, and this is, by the way, that stat that I've just shown you is it, the direct, it's a direct use of the great place to work statements. We've been, uh, great place to work, been kind enough to give us their research and their statements to use, and we know that that correlates with high performance. So the top 100 places to work on average make three times the stock returns of the general stock market. So there's a correlation between engagement and performance, but there's also a correlation on the human case, well-being. So we asked a different question. We were, oh, sorry, I'll just come to this in a second. We also know that the better you get at leadership, there's this thing called extraordinary leadership, the more extraordinary you are, the much more exponential the, uh, the um, result is or the output is or the outcome is. So that what, what it tells us is that if you're going to invest dollars in leadership, always invest it in people who are already good and make them great. You get far more return on investment than trying to make the people who are really bad decent. As I think the psychopath one, you know, <laughs> move them along. <laughs> Which is interesting, because when I wrote my first book, we interviewed 25 leads, which we really, really spent a lot of time choosing. And at the end of it, I asked them off the record, what's the number one regret of your leadership career? 75% of them said not moving, not moving on people fast enough. It was really interesting. So what percentage of a person's mental health can be explained by their boss's behavior, right? That's the question we asked. We measured three key statements of the person's mental health. And what we found is it's about a third. 
So about a third of a person's mental health can be explained by their boss's behavior in the seven mindful leadership practices, which is astonishing. And it was one of, one of the reasons we wanted to research this, is this passion about let's throw a solution, leaders not owning that they are the culture and setting the culture and throwing mental health solutions at the population of the general business and hoping it's going to work, but not looking at their own behavior and their own leadership. And our research tells us it's not going to work because you're going to constantly get put in pain by your leaders. And uh, we, again, we see that that's the good news, but I mean the bad news, but the good news is you can really have a dramatic impact on people's mental health if you lead well, and especially if you really focus on leading well. What we found fascinating in our work is when we present the business case for leadership, people are like, great, 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 but when we present this, it's hard to argue against leadership development when you say, well, I don't really care about the mental health of my people. And we often sort of tweak it a bit higher and go, well, you know, if you're hurting their mental health and they go home, to kids, you're hurting their kids' mental health too. Don't you really care about that? So it's a significant um, correlation between mental, illness, uh, mental wellness and leadership. So what are, just seeing the counter, yeah, eight minutes. Um, what are the seven mindful leadership practices? Again, I just want to say um, you can't tip yourself into change, tips and tricks into change. That's not possible. The research is really clear on that. Um, so I'm going to give you the seven practices, but remind you again, whenever we use this in an organization, we always we use a measurement instrument and a process, a quite rigorous process, to arrive at the one. Because it turns out that great leaders are deliberately developmental. I've never met a great leader who doesn't have a conscious practice around their leadership. It, doesn't, it turns out most of us are not naturally born great leaders. It's a deliberate practice, and Jim and Barry's research is really clear on this too. So the first practice um, is self-awareness, or what we call be here now. What's fascinating to us is we ask our senior leaders, and we've asked thousands and thousands of people this question, what is self-awareness? We know it's a significant practice for leadership. It's very well researched, but what is it? And often the most common response we get is your awareness of your impact on others, which is not self-awareness, of course. That's awareness of others, which is really important, empathy. But it's not self-awareness. And then we ask a second question. If I were to ask you to be self-aware right now, let's be practical about it, right? What would you do to practically be self-aware right now? And astonishingly, astonishingly, I reckon one in 10,000 people can answer that question technically accurately, which just shows what a huge gap we've got in self-awareness training in our, our whole market, this whole area of, of leadership, and just general wellness. People can't answer this question. So you don't practically know how to be self-aware, no. So what, you go to therapy, and then you come back, and you know, what do you actually do? So we teach this skill. Second thing we look at is accountability. So what we find is that the vast majority of leaders we work with think the problem lies outside of themselves, not them. Come and fix my team, it's not me. Or fix my relationship, it's not me. So we spend a tremendous amount of time helping leaders see that they are the problem and the solution to the culture, and they set the culture. That takes a lot of work. And the other piece is holding others to account. It turns out that there's a positive correlation between workplace health and wellness with accountability. Because no one likes to work in a low accountability team. It's soul destroying. You watch people get away with behaviors. They shouldn't be getting behaviors. Performance, not performing. We actually want accountability done gracefully, skillfully, and mindfully. Third one we want is mindful values. And we use the word mindful values because we found a lot of our clients think sort of excellence is a value. And we say, no, that's not really a value the way we would. And we sort of try to, well, what do we mean by values? And we eventually realized we'd meant virtues, practices that when I cultivate them, I become well, I become more uh, congruent within myself, I become more balanced and credible. But what's fascinating again is this is the walk the talk practice in leadership is often we ask clients, so, so you're a leader, yes, yes. Do leaders need to walk the talk? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, what's the talk you're trying to walk? Blank. Oh, that's interesting. So you don't really know or have defined and communicated the talk you're actually trying to walk on a daily basis. And usually for most of us, if you're doing this practically, you can only do up to two values, typically only one. It's usually a brand, but it's not a practice. Mindfulness is about deliberateness, practice, and development. So that's the other interesting question. What do you stand for? And when did you break that? Did you break that last week? Or have you perfected integrity? If you have, please come up here and help, <laughs> help us understand how you did it. The fourth practice is um, a mindful vision. So there's beautiful research around this. People want to work for purpose-based organizations. They don't want to just work for a company that wants to just make money. They want 
something meaningful in their lives. And that's what we call mindful vision. When we define mindfulness in this particular case, it's about creating wellness. Wellness on this planet, wellness within, wellness without. And so leaders, interestingly enough, this is the hardest practice of all, of all the practices for leadership. Very few leaders we work with actually know what their vision is, know what they're trying to achieve. The first practice has been beautifully mentioned in the last panel talk is around, we call it beginner's mind, which is a mindfulness statement, but it's being curious, um, being open, being agile. But what's really interesting is what, why and what kills curiosity. And what we've discovered in our work is it's emotional distress and de emo dis intolerance for emotional distress. The moment something jars emotionally for us, goodbye curiosity. The other fascinating thing is most people do a lot of self-judging they think if I judge myself a lot, I'll, you know, I'll improve or I'll, sort of bad parenting inside yourself. What's really interesting about that is it's completely devoid of curiosity when you're judging yourself, which is why it's so ineffective and you actually don't grow when you're judging yourself. Much better to be curious and look and be open and see what you can discover. That was four years of work for me just to get that one sort of okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> The other ones empower others to shine. A, a, pr a practice of wellness is generosity. And what we find is when we're empowering others, it comes from a heart of generosity. And we write a lot about generosity practice. Um, but it's about this uplifting others. It's also an incredible act of confidence to let or try and make someone's light shine brighter than yours. It's, I think, a supreme level of confidence. And then the seventh practice is called engage the heart. So... Beautiful research around this. Sometimes we often ask our, our leaders, why do people win on the home team? Like when they're at home ground advantage, what is that anyway? And it's because there's a tremendous amount of support and care for people, and that creates higher performance. So we have a simple question we'll ask leaders, do your team play on the away, away ground every day? Or do they play in the home ground? And what does that feel like to play in the home ground? It's every time you do something well, you get cheered on and connect, and it's about human connection. So these are the seven um, uh, mindful leadership practices. And just a quick conclusion, an integrated set of mindfulness practices is a rocket fuel for great leadership and great pl workplace wellness. We've proven this. We've done a, um, we were lucky enough to work with Novartis Pharmaceuticals in Australia for three years with the exec leadership and below. Now we're working with them globally. And we've, we, we did a two-year process of leadership, mindful leadership, and their, their staff turnover more than halved and their engagement went into best place to work levels, and we've several case studies. It works, and you can change people if you do it singular with depth. Mindful leadership does make a difference, and you can measure it too, which we're now doing, and you can develop it in your organization. Thank you so much.